uh, is an invited speaker. He's, a, he's Craig Gidney from Google. He's pretty much the only person I know in the field who's got a nickname that he's easily recognized by. That's Craig the Compiler Gidney. And uh, he's known as that for his ability to compile down quantum algorithms. They use fewer gates. And in this talk, he's going to be talking about doing just that to Shaw's algorithm so that he obtains an algorithm that will solve a 2048-bit version of RSA. Okay, Craig, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so I, I feel like the, the things that I'm going to say on this slide have been handled already, so I'll just go to the next one. Um, so the general plan for the talk is that I'm going to discuss sort of the high-level stuff of who we worked with and why we did these things and, and kind of the, the, the mindset that we had as we did it. And then I'll get into more of the, the details where I might lose some people sometimes of the specific techniques we used. And I'll probably have to skip at least one for time. And then I'll go on to kind of closing remarks and, and observations about these types of problems. So context. I'll start with the fact that, I mean, I did not do this work alone. I, I worked with other people. So I worked with Martin Kerr, who was a cryptographer from Sweden. And I also worked with Austin Fowler, who was kind of an error correction expert uh, and also a coworker at Google. The reason that we worked on this is like, it's known that there are these quantum attacks on classical crypt, some classical crypto systems. And some of these crypto systems are used on the internet for important things. And our goal with this was not to make that problem worse, but to make it better. So we didn't go in thinking, oh boy, we're going to make this happen sooner. It's more like, this is going to happen at some fixed point in time. You know, and we would like to know what that point in time is. And if we think that this thing is 100 times more expensive than it actually is, then it could end up that we're in a situation where we think we have two years left to work with. And then we find out that, oh no, actually it happened last year and you had to be ready then. So we would like to know how much time we have and we'd like that estimate to not move behind us all of a sudden. We'd like to have a little bit of foresight. And, and I should point out like, it, it's not trivial to replace a crypto system. There, there's standardization processes, there's all kinds of software that has to be rewritten. There's all kinds of hardware that's out there in the world with these things like baked into the circuits that has to be replaced. It's a ton of work. And we have to know, should we be putting effort into getting this done in five years or in 50 years? Because that really affects how you go about things as a, as a company or as a government or whatever. Part of the effect of thinking about this in terms of understanding the, the costs of attacks is that we, we kind of want to avoid particularly abstract models of thinking about the costs. We want to get really down to the, the, the details. Uh, I would have gone all the way down to like estimating dollars, except I have no idea how to go about doing that for like, it would be way too speculative and, and honestly, I'm not an accounting. So instead we kind of settled for, all right, instead of working in the abstract circuit model, we'll work in the physical qubit count model where you have noisy qubits and error correction overhead and so forth. Uh, and this is actually kind of interesting in a couple ways because it, it can invert some things that you think are a good idea. So, Somewhat surprisingly, our strongest competition in terms of the cost estimates that we cared about were not from last year or two years ago, they were from 15 years ago. And the reason for that is because 15 years ago is maybe when people started getting really clever with how they saved qubits and did convoluted things that made them do more operations instead of uh, using more qubits. And I mean, I definitely have at least one preprint on the archive where I make the number of operations 10 times worse to save a single qubit. Like that's taking this to an extreme. I have another example on this slide, which was uh, by Hanner et al, where they use two registers in their paper, whereas in our paper, we used three registers. All right, so they use two thirds of the space in the abstract circuit model. But then once you take into account of the fact that they have to run for longer, so they have to protect more volume, and they need a larger code distance and you take that into account, it ends up being more. So like the way these trade-offs play off is important. And, and that was one of the interesting things about this particular paper. Um, 
One of the downsides of making one of these physical estimates instead of an abstract estimate is there's several more assumptions that go into them than you do in the abstract case. Like with the abstract case, you can get these kind of timeless estimates of just like you, you run the circuits, you get the exact gate count and that's the end of it. Whereas when you start going down to the physical, you, you always have this like, well, if hardware behaves this way, then it'll be this expensive. And if the hardware is better, it'll be better. It's a little bit fuzzier in that way. But uh, I will at least state what my assumptions are. And I'm from a superconducting qubit group. So these assumptions are sort of maybe typical of that. In particular, the gate speeds of superconducting qubits are pretty good. They're about a megahertz. Uh, sorry, the gates are not a megahertz. The, the time that we can run the surface code, like the measure all the local stabilizers that are present in that code, we could expect to be able to do that in about a microsecond. Um, our goal is to get down to error rates where we expect something to go wrong about one every thousand gates, or at least that's what we tell the hardware engineers. When we do our estimates, we translate that into a more useful form to us where we think in terms of how much error suppression do we get as we increase the code distance. And so there's actually quite a lot of give in this 99.9%, .9%. like some gates can be worse than others, uh, like all kinds of, interesting situations. When it comes down to the estimates, what we really care about is this five decibels, really. Uh, another thing that is maybe a little surprising or that you, you haven't thought about before is the fact that the classical control system that you wrap around your quantum computer will have some particular rate that it can error correct your logical measurements and then decide what to do with them. And that's actually an important rate for determining the speed of your quantum computer. Like the way that we do computation in this paper is limited by the reaction time of the control system ultimately. And so the fact that this is 100 kilohertz instead of 50 kilohertz directly kind of multiplies into the running time that I say in the title of the paper. Uh, so the other downside of making physical estimates is that you realize how incredibly expensive fault tolerance is. Like it, it, it's actually kind of depressing and if there's a quantum winter, this might be a big reason that it happens. It's, if you look at, I want to take a computation that I was going to run classically, and I'm instead going to run it quantumly, you're crazy because it's going to be a billion times more expensive in terms of the amount of hardware, uh, hardware time that you need. And the only reason that you can get away with having that huge front cost is that there is these particular problems where they have much better quantum algorithms. So factoring is an example of that where we have this amazing speed up. And by the time you get to these problem sizes where n is equal to 2000, it, you've completely overcome this factor of a billion and, and then some. Whereas other problems which just have more modest speed ups, so like quadratic speed ups like Grover search, it's unclear if you could even run a big enough instance to overcome this penalty. In, in any case, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, up to like three months before we published, people had put out uh, estimates for how big they thought these algorithms would be. And basically this, this number has stayed unchanged since like 2010, where it was thought you'd need about a billion qubits for a day. Uh, I mean, people's physical assumptions will, will change around. When you read these papers, they might say, a number that's five times lower, but also they'll say their gate speed is five times faster, for example. But after we adjusted for all of that, we found that basically everyone was around a gigacubit day. Uh, and what we did in our work is we brought that down by two orders of magnitude. Uh, and we did that by kind of using the same resources in a more clever way. So that, that leads into what actually did we do? Like, how did we make this better? Uh, and the answer is that it's not just one thing, it's actually several things. We did stuff to make the adders better. We did stuff to make the multipliers better. We did stuff to make the exponentiation better. We did stuff to make the way that you compile your gates into the surface code better. And uh, Martin and his supervisor found ways like at the algorithmic level or the, the number theory level to pick a better thing to do period finding on that you know, made you use a smaller number of exponent qubits. So I'm gonna be talking about these first three, uh, you know, time permitting, probably we'll only talk about one or two of them. Um, but just to give you like a basic idea, 
almost all the savings came from improving arithmetic circuits. And these weren't like, you know, crazy quantum special optimizations. These were, these were taking classical techniques that are known to work, fixing something about them that prevented them from working in the quantum case, and then using them in the quantum case. And then the other stuff, like the, the packing stuff into space time and the, the number theory stuff, they gave like modest speed ups. These were, these were important because they affected the code distance that we ultimately used. But uh, really, this, this is where all of the, the big savings were. So let, let's talk about what we did to the adder. Um, so there's this problem when you do a modular addition. And the problem is that your modulus isn't a power of two. And the thing that's fast is when you add modulo a power of two, because you don't have to do a bunch of comparisons and so forth. And the basic idea of an approximate encoded permutation is, well, what if we just used a power of two adder, like a two's complement adder, but we made it so that the case where it fails is just kind of rare. And the way you do that is you basically take what is one state and then you spread it over a superposition of many, 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 many states. So if your one green became many greens. And then you just do the normal addition stuff in that space. And the idea is there's basically only one spot where there's a failure, like this one place where the register overflows and you go to the wrong number. And as long as you spread over enough things, that one failure case will be negligible. All right. But then you get to use your, your cheap thing. So that, that's the underlying idea. And, and actually, this, this basic idea is not novel to us. Like uh, Zalka had that specific idea of using a non modular adder to perform a modular addition uh, 15, 15 years ago. Uh, Although it's kind of thought of differently in that paper, where it's thought of as like you prepare this, this big superposition of all of the multiples of n and you shift it by x in order to encode x. And this big superposition, which you could imagine being plotted out as like a comb, when you shift it over by n, it lines up with itself again. And the only difference between the shifted and unshifted version are these ones at the ends. And as long as your comb is exponentially long in the length of your padding, you can easily make that as small as you'd like so that you're as close to a fixed point of the plus n operation as you need, at which point it doesn't matter that it's not really doing a modular addition. It's so close that you'll never see anything different. So one of the things that we did in this paper, or rather one of the papers we pulled out of this paper because the paper was getting too big, is we generalize this a little bit to the case where you want to take an addition and split it into pieces. So suppose you have a register with this, this, this series of white boxes is supposed to represent a register. And uh, because, because I'm a programmer instead of a person who does math on paper, I, I made the numbers go from left to right instead of from right to left. So I apologize for that. But suppose you, you want to increment whatever number is written down here. Well, you have uh, but you're not allowed to like look at the digits. The, the, like a quantum computer has to apply the same steps apply the same steps no matter what. What you end up having to do as part of adding one is, well, you add one here and maybe there's a carry. So you, you might have to add one there and then maybe there, there's a carry. And th this process keeps going, like the carry might propagate all the way across the register. There's a certain sense in which that's really unlikely or like a really low weight case. But if you want your circuit to be correct, you have to handle it. And uh, unless you want to put some constraint over your input data, you can't just say, well, my input's kind of random, so I don't want to worry about it. Uh, the way that we get around that issue of we can't assume that our input will have a property that allows us to terminate the carry is we purposely put on a runway that's prepared into a special state where we know we can probabilistically terminate. So um, to be specific, what we do is we append a bunch of plus qubits here. So each of these yellow things starts as a plus qubit. And then we subtract it out of this the second half of the register. And the idea is if you increment this, this low half and you have this carry that's propagating along, and oh no, it's going to go into the really long case and I don't want to wait for it to go all the way down here. I can instead divert it this way to the runway, which will be much shorter. And the state that we're preparing is specifically chosen to have this property that when you take a carry and you move it from going this way to going that way, that that particular operation is a fixed point of the state. 
or very nearly a fixed point. It, it's, it's very much like an approximation. And as you make this runway longer, the approximation gets exponentially better. And once you, once you apply that, once you create this runway and you split into pieces like this, you end up with this great property that if you want to add a number into this full register, you can do it completely independently by taking the low part of the number and adding it into the low part of the register with this runway at the end, and taking the high part of the number and adding it into the high part. So the reason that that's so great is that it means that the depth of the addition is suddenly much, much smaller. And you can do things in parallel. So you can combine that with what Zalka did. Um, so not only do we put multiple runways along the length of the register, but we'll put this modular to not modular padding at the end. And then we'll, we'll split it all up. And so we'll get some number of pieces. And we can basically pick the number of pieces to be whatever we want. The, the length of the runways will get a little bit longer if we use more pieces and, and so forth. But Basically, when you're talking about big pieces, it doesn't matter. Like here, I have some example numbers from like uh, scripts that we wrote for the paper, which said if we picked a piece size of 1,024, then once we padded it, it was 1,070. So you're talking about like a 5% a overhead in the size of the pieces. But now that your depth is, uh, now that your adder is in four pieces, your depth has gone down by a factor of four. So you get these like huge savings in the depth for pretty negligible. Uh, costs in the top leak count because the top leak count is proportional to the to the sum of the lengths. This is different from most previous ways of decreasing the depth of the addition in that most previous ways of decreasing the depth that had this huge upfront cost. Like if you use a carry look ahead adder, instead of using n topolies to perform your adder, all of a sudden you have to use 5n or 10n. Whereas with this one, you get a, a very small overhead and you can kind of ease your way into it and gradually increase the overhead. So when you like compare this technique to previous stuff, it, it like completely blows everything else out of the water. Although to be fair, um, this initial difference, this is because of Zalka's technique. So uh, I, I can't take credit for that, that's Zalka. But the fact that it stays low as we go to the right, that's what we contributed. So the fact that it doesn't slope up the ways the way that these are sloping up. So this like made the the adders significantly better and and helped a lot with the cost of the paper. Uh, so now let's move on to the multipliers, which I think we'll have time to get through, in, including the time that I need at the end in order to do the overviews. Um, the basic idea behind the improving weight to the multiplier is this idea of windowing. And the idea of windowing is, suppose you have this series of controlled additions where, where these are qubit controls, and these k's are classical constants. You can break this up into eight cases, like the case where all of the control qubits are off, where zero will get added, or the case where all the control qubits are on, where k1 plus k2 plus k3 will get added, or all the, you know, any of those eight cases. And you can put those into a table and then you can treat these three qubits as an integer, which is an address into that table. And then you can perform a table lookup, like uh, with like known techniques for doing a QROM read. And we know how much that costs under fault tolerance, and it's it has a toffle account proportional to the length of the table. So here we have three qubits, uh, so W would be three, and so we have a cost of n plus eight instead of six n. So this uh, just to explain the six n is that each adder has a cost n, except it's controlled, so that's a factor of two, and there's three of them, so that, that makes six. So with w so small, you can see this just like a factor of six saving for free. And uh, basically, you just, you just take this and you apply it to a multiplication. So the typical way that a multiplication circuit is structured in a quantum computation is as a series of controlled additions, where you know the, the twos qubit of the register determines whether or not you add two times the constant you're trying to multiply by into some target register. So you, you just pick some window size W, and instead of doing N additions or N control additions, you'll do N divided by W additions. And the cost you pay is you have to do these lookups, which have a cost of two to the W. So it, it's pretty clear you can't make W particularly big, or this lookup cost will explode. But you can make it about the logarithm of n, and that will make it about as expensive as doing the addition. 
but you'll be doing log times fewer things. And so this, this just buys you a log factor for free. And this is not like one of those log factors that you, you know, have to pay a constant factor that's bigger than the size of the universe or, or something like that. It's, it's just a straight log factor that you get. And even better, uh, uh, so we, I mean, I, I ran the numbers on this and it, it actually is better at the, the sizes that are relevant to factoring. And it's even better than like Karatsuba multiplication, at least at this size. Eventually this yellow line, which is the Karatsuba multiplication, the cost will get below this blue line. It might not look like it on this plot, but asymptotically it will. Uh, but at the sizes we care about, this is still a win. Now you can pull the same trick with exponentiation. It gets more complicated. And I, I wish that I could explain this, but I actually find it very difficult to explain. And also there's not much time. I'm going to skip over the, the auto CCZ part here. So hopefully everyone saw all that. And I'll just pause here for a second to just point out the reason this slide is here is just to, as like a certificate of the fact that we actually thought about how are things laid out in the computation? Like, like we didn't just count operations. We thought, how do things fit together? So like we have our, our data that we're going to try to add. We have our CCZ factories as these red boxes with these pink boxes that I haven't explained because there's no time and like the adders. We, we thought about how this all has to fit together in order for things to work. Uh, actually, at least one of the comments that I saw on the internet was people who thought that we had like written software to generate these and that we were like ready to run the factoring algorithm as soon as we had a computer or something like, no, 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 these, these were made in 3D modeling programs by hand just to, to visualize what was going on in our heads. All right, so takeaways from the paper. First of all, we didn't just estimate the cost of 2048 bits, we estimated the cost of a variety of sizes. And essentially what we found is that the costs obviously do go up as the, the size, as the size of the key that you want to factor goes up, but not enough that you would really think of this as a defense strategy. Like if quantum computers grow in scale in any way similar to how classical computers, like supercomputers grew in scale, then by the time you're breaking these keys, it's not that long, like a year or two until you're breaking these keys. So this is not a long-term strategy. Um, the other thing is like, I mentioned most of the improvements we made were to arithmetic as opposed to anything really that specific to factoring. And so these techniques generalize to other things. And in fact, they've been used to other things. So this paper that came out pretty recently where Anner et al. took these tech, like took window arithmetic and they applied it to the elliptic curve problem and they got a huge speed up there as well. So that now the elliptic curve problem is again cheaper than the uh, factoring problem in terms of quantum costs for similar classical security. And lastly, uh, I just wanna have a few rules of thumb go out to the world so that people know about them. So first of all, uh, when you're thinking about optimizing one of these large scale quantum algorithms, you should not be thinking in terms of, I wanna reduce the time or I wanna reduce the space, at least at first. You should be thinking in terms of, I wanna reduce time multiplied by space. Because ultimately this is like a packing problem. If you can make your pieces smaller, it'll be much easier. The second one is like, I'm a computer scientist. I like exact discrete things, so it's kind of, felt kind of icky to me to like use these approximate operations and so forth. But the benefit of doing it is, is gigantic. And uh, if you have a similar aversion to me, you should, you know, try to get over it. Uh, the window of multiplication thing used these small lookups. I found that this is a common thing in at least papers that I worked on, like having a lookup has ended up being like a key thing that helps. And lastly, although I feel like I might have emphasized this already, it's, if you're making cost estimates, you should always try to keep grounded in terms of what this ultimately turns into. Like think about the cost estimate below the level that you're actually working at, just to have some idea of what you're doing continues to make sense at the, at the lower ground level. Uh, and that's all, I'll move on to questions now.
thank you, Craig. <clears throat> that was a great talk. So just to remind everyone that's listening, if you have a question, could you enter it in the uh, appropriate Slack channel window? Yep. So I think I'll just start off with asking the question first, if that's okay. So um, if I've understood correctly, you're saying that the main thing that you've done is reduce the depth of the algorithm. So you said that no. at some point uh, there's a slight increase in the top leads and then there's a slight decrease. So is the total it, top of the count? It depends who changed? you're comparing against. So if you look in the abstract circuit model, then it does just look like we made it, you know, wider and then shallower. But if you actually compare against people who are like accounting for, oh, I need magic state factories and I need space for them, then we did reduce the size also because we use far fewer magic state factories ultimately. So okay. it, it, why do you need fewer magic state factories? Maybe I missed that bit. Hello? Say what? Um, so you were saying that it's not just the case that you've traded with, um, with Yeah. With if you look in the abstract circuit model, it looks like that. But if you look at the physical level, it doesn't look like that. Okay. Because um, what the, the amount of magic state factory you need is negligible compared to the num total number of... It's because in the past when people have looked at they've looked at the run times that result from using as few magic state factories as possible and they get numbers in years and that's unacceptable. And so they use many, many, many of them in order to get run times in weeks instead, for example. And, and that results in a very, very wide computation. Okay. Okay, we've got a few questions uh, on Slack now. So uh, the first question from Rob Whitney is, you didn't mention a noise model. Ah, so, so the noise model that, that this number comes from, five decibels per code distance, uh, was circuit level noise with like random polys injected at particular um, customizable levels per gate that were representative of the hardware at the time. Okay, so Richard Wyman has asked, where do you think further optimizations could be found? So is there any space left for th further optimization? Um, certainly the magic state factories can be made smaller. So Daniel Latinsky has a paper where he just like simulates the distillation procedure with noise and sees how well it performs. And it did surprisingly well, which indicates that maybe our code distances are too conservative on the state factories. Mm -hmm. And at the very least, uh, like we have several ideas for making the magic state factories smaller. So they currently take up about a third of the volume. So that could be one thing. Another thing we could do is um, the qubits spend a pretty decent proportion of their time just sitting still waiting for stuff to get to them. So if we layered another code on top so that we could lower the code distance, like anything that lets make memory more compact would probably be a small win. Yet another thing that you can do is the structure of this particular algorithm is because the adder is piecewise, the computation is almost entirely piecewise. The only thing that's not piecewise is like a, a particular detail to do with how the, the lookups do, the lookups happen for the additions, but it's an extremely small amount of data. If you could send five qubits to, between the computers every 16 milliseconds or something like that, that would be absolutely enough to distribute the computation. So you, if instead of making one big computer, you could make 10 smaller computers and then run the computation across them. Um, so the next question is from Ashley Montanaro. So he's asking, do you think that any of the lessons you've learned from this work in the fault tolerant regime are applicable in the NISC error mitigation regime? I don't know. I, I don't think so. They're, they're too different. Um, like fault tolerance, you're all worried about magic state factories and, and so forth. And in NISC, you're just, they're, they're really just too different. Um, like in fault, the fault tolerance, you'd never ever use a post selection strategy to make your whole computation better. But in NISC, that's like what everyone is doing. It, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, probably there's something clever that someone could make for an analogy, but I, I don't see that analogy. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if different has anything different. <laughs> um, uh. So we've got a question from uh, Cameron Calcliffe. What is the scaling at the number of qubits with respect to the length of the keys? 
Uh, so it's kind of complicated because it has to do with the logarithmic overhead. Um, hold on, just gonna get to the to that slide. So if you look here, it kind of looks like the, the qubits are going up by a factor of three every time you increase the bits by a factor of two, like roughly. But it, that scaling doesn't make sense uh, given what we know about the asymptotics. So probably what you're seeing here is just like log factors saturating or something like that. Um, so in the regime that matters, it's sort of like you get a factor of three for each factor of two. But in the like long asymptotic regime, it should basically be like n log n or something like that. Oh, wow. So even though th these are quite large RSA keys, it's still dominated by pre-asymptotic scaling. Yeah, it, it's because the surface code takes a while to get going, basically. Okay. Um... But you need to get to pretty, you need to get like distance 30 or 35 before the surface code is, is really in its, in its happy yeah. place where it's not getting bigger. So uh, David Shaw is asking a question. I think it refers to something you said right at the beginning of the talk where you're talking about um, other problems that aren't like uh, factoring. Yeah, yeah I, I can see it. Yes, yeah, so he's saying. asking about the, the Grover style speed up and yeah. if I can point to more specific analysis on that problem of is Grover enough? Uh, well, actually, I know that Ashley Montanaro and Earl and maybe, <laughs> maybe have a paper about exactly that where, uh, in my opinion, the abstract of the paper has the wrong conclusion, where they talk <laughs> about, ah, oh, yes, we managed to get a quantum speed up by using a like pentillion qubits versus one desktop computer in order to outperform it in time. Uh, so I, I think that's a great paper if you just like skip that one line of the abstract where it says that the quantum computer got a speed up. Yeah, I think, they, the final, I think the final line of the abstract is saying something more in line with what you said at the beginning of your talk, right? That yeah. once you take into account the cost that of all of the things that go into the quantum computer, then it becomes difficult to argue that you're seeing a speed up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think that's all of the questions that we've got. If I've missed any, then Greg, you should have a look at the Slack channel and, and answer them. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see someone ask for references and I'll put them in the chat. Okay, okay well, let's all uh, thank Craig for the virtual clap. And uh, okay, thank you. There's my virtual clap. Okay, thank you, Craig. So.